Mariko Yoshida vs. Megumi Fuji from the May 24th, 2003 Arjun show at Tokyo Differ Ariaki is a match that will likely always be relevant no matter how fighting or fans' perceptions of it changes. Pro wrestling has had a huge television presence since the 1950s, while early MMA was often difficult to even pay for due to political pressures limiting their ability to operate, causing it to take 12 years to really become mainstream. Sooner or later, almost every child of the 20th century stumbled across pro wrestling, and many became hooked before they ever witnessed a legitimate sanctioned full rules fight, often maintaining at least a nostalgic interest because wrestling plays well enough to anyone willing to look past a certain amount of nonsense. Michael Betts, the MMA historian who runs our Cocktogi Road Patreon, enjoys contemplating what useful role pro wrestling can play in an MMA world, particularly enjoying the tightrope act walk during the mid-period of the original battle arts run, where the matches were still rooted in martial arts and attempted to maintain a real fight feel, requiring actual footwork and legitimate grappling skills, yet granted themselves more and more freedom to break away into a spectacular move or lucha sequence. If you're going to watch pro wrestling, you might as well see something you can't get from MMA, as long as it isn't so stupid that it jars you out of the illusion of it being a fight. Similar to movies, the important thing is that they're well-crafted to facilitate the suspension of disbelief. The WWE's answer to pro wrestling's continued relevance has been to avoid all aspects that once made people consider it a sport, relying on everything that makes it impossible to take seriously by amping up the soap opera, shenanigans, and buffoonery. I still think any style of pro wrestling is viable, but rather than endlessly perpetuating the same old nonsense, it would be nice if things were actually improving based upon what we've learned from 31 years of MMA. Imagine if we started with the premise that there's no reason for something that doesn't work in a real fight to exist in pro wrestling, unless it's actually worth finding a way to incorporate. We could then easily eliminate turning your back on your opponent, walking in circles when the opponent is prone, posing, flat-footed no-defense striking, laying around pretending to be dead, alerting the opponent of your injury so they know where to target their next attack, outside interference, and other assorted silliness. Shifting to match times that have proven to be realistic, this nonsensical filler would no longer be necessary, allowing workers to actually have the energy to constantly press their advantage and convey the intensity and urgency of a life or death struggle that makes fights interesting and their outcomes meaningful. Even if these ideas, as well as the Yoshida vs. Fujii match, are largely descendants of the UWF shoot fighting revolution, Yoshida vs. Fujii is a further evolution of a style that largely died at the end of the 1990s due to the popularity of Pride FC. It's a fight that not only proves pro wrestling still serves a purpose, but that well done fake fighting is likely to wind up being more entertaining than most real fighting because the workers can control as many aspects of the fight as they need to, answering all the criticisms MMA faces in the process, such as fights stalling out, becoming too repetitive, and looking too similar because everyone more or less trains the same way now. The best example of how a real fighter can come in with minimal pro wrestling training and immediately improve the quality, credibility, intensity, and urgency of pro wrestling was this brilliant debut of Fujii. What made Arjun an excellent and groundbreaking promotion in their first two years is trainer and ace Yoshida got most of the wrestlers to adapt to the changes in combat sports and modernize pro wrestling into something more MMA oriented without actually being shoot wrestling. They all trained with pan crazed fighters and assorted martial artists picked up the basics and some things beyond, but outside of high-level judoka Hiromi Yagi, who Yoshida had her previous best match with on February 18, 1999, Yoshida's opponents didn't come from a legitimate combat sports background. Long before 2003, Arjun had sealed their fate by shedding the identity that made them the most unique and exciting Joshi promotion of their time, completely homogenizing their product into something that truly pleased no one by doing every style passably, rather than growing their devoted fan base by doing their thing really well. Yoshida had lost her influence, and every time we saw nonsense such as Rossi Ogawa making a fool of himself as a cringy tiger mask, we had to laugh at what our once thrilling incredible promotion had become, so as to not become too depressed. Yoshida was no longer able to do her style regularly, but on the league's penultimate TV show, we finally got to see what she could do with a real mixed martial artist, and it was otherworldly the best women's grappling-oriented match we've ever seen. Yoshida carried her student Akino to one of the best debuts ever on July 21st, 1998, and they had several high-quality matches throughout the years, but Yoshida was not at all the story of this match. Although Yoshida facilitated all the pro wrestling aspects, which were the least useful and successful of the contest, dragging Fuji through a few locks and throws with no real-world application, the match is more about her trying to keep up with this then-unknown warp-speed grappler. 
Rather than it feeling like the debuting Fuji was laboring to figure out pro wrestling, what was so thrilling about this match is it instead decidedly felt like Yoshida was struggling to hang with a real fighter in a more legitimate contest. As with best in the world and interpromotional matches, the more the stakes are raised due to pride and bragging rights, the more interesting it becomes for the fans because the fighters put their best foot forward, trying their hardest not to get shown up. Perhaps it should be obvious that Fuji was the story of the match, given what an unreal competitor she was in Judo, Sambo, BJJ, ADCC, MMA, anything and everything she tried. Fuji had excellent but not off the charts results in Judo, which her father began teaching her at age 3, finishing in the top 8 in the All Japan Student Championships at 52 kilograms 3 years in a row during high school. But it seemingly wasn't until she started Sambo at 23 after graduating college that everything really began to click winning the All Japan Championship every year from 1998 through 2005, with four silver medals in the Worlds. At the same time, she also won the All Japan Championships in BJJ in 2002 and 2003, and the Pan American Championships in 2004 and 2006 after starting her MMA career in 2004, where she won 22 consecutive fights, generally against larger women, before her first quote-unquote loss came at age 36 when Bellator screwed her out of a decision against Zoila frosto Gurgel on October 28, 2010. Fuji was the female MMA GOAT, which was truly amazing because she wasn't any sort of physical specimen. She didn't have an overpowering takedown, great reach, huge knockout power, some sort of obviously great genetics, but she had amazing speed and precision and was so skilled, driven, creative, and well-rounded that she'd find a way. Even arguably more credentialed modern ground fighters such as Mackenzie Dern, who won the Worlds in both submission grappling and BJJ in 2015, among countless other medals, have not been able to show the same grappling wizardry in MMA as Fuji, who earned the nickname Queen of the Seconds Kill for her quick submission victories. When Fuji wrestled Yoshida, she wasn't known outside of the amateur ranks in sports that don't get a lot of press, while Yoshida was peerless in the MMA-oriented style match. Anyone assuming this would be a master versus a debuting student who hasn't put the usual amount of time into pro wrestling training because it was just a fun side project was in for quite a shock, as Yoshida had so much respect for the skills of Fuji that she actually let her lead the majority of the match. Yoshida had befriended Fuji at the AACC dojo, and eventually got her to give pro wrestling a try. This wound up not only being the greatest pro wrestling debut ever, but the best fight ever in the female grappling genre. Having recently gone through all the male shoot fighting stuff from 1991 through 1993 for Kaktogi Road, this is better than anything even the all-time greats of the genre, Kiyoshi Tamura and Volkan did during those prime shoot fighting years, which perhaps shows that the rise of MMA did contribute to the quality of their later works against each other, Tsuyoshi TK Kosaka and Yoshihisa Yamamoto. The best Hiromitsu Kanihara vs Masakazu Maeda matches feel like they are worth mentioning due to sharing the all-out attacking nature, but I don't have any trouble calling Yoshida vs Fuji better. Pro wrestling organizations getting known credentialed athletes from other combat sports to moonlight jobbing to their far lesser credentialed stars has been a huge part of validating the so-called superiority of pro wrestling. Yoshida vs Fuji contrasted the historical pro wrestler vs real fighter match, not only for being a classic, but also because it was more a showcase for the outsider. It definitely made a difference over the typical wrestler versus kickboxer debacle that grappling is a lot easier to do credibly than striking, since it's less noticeable when someone is a little off the pressure point, or isn't cranking or torquing optimally, than when they're hitting air. But the difference here was that Yoshida didn't make this about getting herself over, instead challenging herself to go with Fuji's great grappling. In the realistic style match that they did, Fuji already knew most of what she needed to know. Sure, she had to learn to take some bumps and work out escapes to some unusual positions, but because the match was rooted in realism, mostly she did things she'd learned elsewhere long ago. What's so astonishing is Fuji was able to confidently perform all her chain grappling at lightning speed despite Yoshida's reactions being different than the usual opponent who wasn't cooperating. Her ability to go all out showed a great deal of trust in Yoshida's ability and respect for her skill. Fuji did it all flawlessly, with the few issues coming when Yoshida couldn't quite keep up with the pace they desired. In the end, while there are similarities to the high-speed scrambling performances of Kiyoshi Tamura, the creative submission chaining of Volkan, and the work of Little Volk Kideo Tokoro, though Fuji was able to win real fights doing Volkan things that Tokoro was usually only able to succeed in entertaining with, it isn't too hyperbolic to say that this is somewhat unlike anything you've ever seen, before or really even since. 
The pace was fantastic. They just went all out, almost non-stop as if it were an MMA match, with the exception of Fuji escaping to the floor late in the second, doing five more cool things in the time other wrestlers would have filled with aimless meandering. They weren't killing the submissions to keep the fans interested, but rather they did such a great job of making every motion seem legitimately useful that it was okay that most of them only succeeded in the micro, if at all. Fuji's quickness, athleticism, and explosiveness were much more striking here than they probably ever were in an MMA match, and she really just hit it out of the park in all aspects to the point the only possible argument against her as Rookie of the Year is she didn't continue wrestling. Fuji really outshined Yoshida in this match in literally every way, and if pro wrestling wasn't merely a brief hobby she dabbled in during her quest to master all the real grappling arts, I'm confident she would have been the go in that too. Her movement, entries, traps, feints, and crazy athletic attacks were just a thing of beauty. Fuji never stopped launching attacks or diversions on the mat, sometimes seeming to be setting up two techniques at once and just taking the one that seemed most available. Yoshida had always led against less confident workers, so she rarely had to react so quickly in response, adjusting to so many different attacks and threats. Yoshida really upped her game here, doing a great job of working a lot faster than she ever had before to keep up with Fujii. Sometimes Yoshida was able to utilize her size advantage to throw Fujii around or rough her up, but usually Fujii was just so quick she had another take down her submission attempt before Yoshida could set it up. Another thing that really impressed me is the match wasn't the least bit repetitive. This may seem a weird comment, but given they didn't utilize many unrealistic high spots, and one of the competitors was a novice, You'd think they might have been short on material, but this match was really diverse in all the positions, sweeps, and submissions they were able to show over the course of 13 and a half minutes. They did keep going back to Yoshida's air raid crash and spider twist finishers because they were telling the story that Yoshida needed her best pro wrestling offense to win, since she wasn't winning the battles in the areas that Fuji was familiar with. They didn't make it easy on Fuji in the sense that they placed a differentiation on her shoulders, asking her to keep having different answers for Yoshida's top techniques. My favorite counter was a sort of modified flying crucifix takedown where Fuji got her legs over Yoshida's head while Yoshida was standing and was able to go into the armbar once she got Yoshida onto her back. Fuji's one pro wrestling high spot was super creative, taking Yoshida over with a hurricanrana, but instead of going into the pin, she floated into an Achilles tendon hold, then switched into a half crab. They rarely released the opponent, chaining one submission attempt after another where they kept adjusting until they decided to switch the point of attack. Fuji had Yoshida on the defensive from the get-go, using the Imanari roll, a jumping leg lock, some crazy jumping guard pull sweep into an arm bar, and a flying armbar that Yoshida was saved from by the first round bell. The weakness of the match was Fuji was so obviously superior to Yoshida on the mat that there wasn't a lot of space for Yoshida to try to compete with her there, so she was almost pushed into using her pro wrestling oriented offense, similar to how Yoshida's opponents would generally try to beat her in stand-up because the ground was a losing battle. Yoshida kind of had success with pro wrestling techniques due to the element of surprise. For example, Yoshida got a pedigree in after stuffing Fuji's second double leg takedown. Yoshida has never been so owned on the mat, and she took some of her frustration out by stomping Fuji even after she got to the ropes. In general, these diversions didn't help the quality of the match, particularly Yoshida's phony punch combo in the corner, and they sometimes fell out of place. The action managed to kick up a couple more gears late in the second, and this time Fuji was saved by the bell from Yoshida's spider twist. The third round was just nuts, working at overdrive, doing one speed submission or air raid crash counter after another. I'm probably making it sound like the match was less competitive than it actually was. The whole thing was back and forth at light speed one way or another, and though Fuji seemed to be dominant, it was more that she's an all-time great athlete who is a lot more dynamic and has otherworldly speed and explosion. Yoshida might answer her move for move, but you've never seen someone in a pro wrestling ring that's going so hard and fast on the ground as Fujii. She really made every movement seem important to her goal of winning. The third round in particular was both having answers for everything their opponent could possibly think of, with Yoshida pushing herself to the absolute maximum of her capabilities to keep up with the ease and fluidity of Fujii's counters, attacks, and adjustments. Fujii may be new to this style of fighting, but virtually everything she did was performed with the speed and confidence of someone who does it in her sleep. Fuji eventually made the mistake of getting sucked into striking, and Yoshida wound up winning the match with a backslide at 3.30 of round 3, which obviously wasn't the most convincing finish, but it was logical in the sense that it's something Fuji wouldn't expect or be used to defending. Fuji unfortunately didn't return often because she was off conquering the world, but Yoshida, 
who was by far the most successful trainer of the past three decades in terms of turning athletes into quality workers, did send her students to roll with Fuji, who was still instrumental during the Ibuki era. This was a truly unique match, showcasing state-of-the-art technical skill. If the question is how pro wrestling can meaningful exist in an MMA world, one answer is certainly Yoshida vs. Fuji. I give this match 5 out of 5 stars. It's the best Joshi Pro Rest match of 2003, and probably the best match of that year overall.